So we're going to start in Ecclesiastes 5, 8, 9. If you see the poor oppressed in a district and justice and rights denied, do not be surprised at such things. For one official is eyed by a higher one, and over them both are others still higher. The increase from the land is taking by the king himself and profits from the field. So I don't think anybody would disagree with this. Corruption in the world and in the government is just a fact. I don't think anybody would be surprised at that. Do you think it was a true in the same time of Solomon? Was there corruption in Solomon's days? I would, I would think so. In, uh, in verse 9, it states that we all get something, but the king profits the most. Does the king work? Mostly, probably not. I don't know. So if you look at the world today and see corruption, do you think it, would, think it was any different in Solomon's time? Think there was any corruption in Solomon's time? I, I would think so. Uh, Rehoboam was Solomon's son and uh, who became king after King Solomon. And in 1 Kings 12.4 it says, Your father put a heavy yoke on us, but now lighten our harsh labor and heavy yoke put on us and we will serve you. So Solomon expected heavy labor from his Israelites, from the workers, but you think, do you, do you think he had different levels of government taking care of that? And one thing we know about government is they probably were corrupt. So we need to remember that even good leaders and authority are sinners. So corruption in government is just a fact. So in Ecclesiastes 5, 10, and 11, it says, Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their in income. This too is meaningless. As good, goods increase, so do, the consume, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owners except to feast their eyes on them? J.D. Rockefeller was like one of the richest men in the world. And I can't remember, I think he was worth like $200 billion. And somebody asked him once, is, how much money is enough? And does anybody know what he answered? Just one more, just one dollar more. So was Rockefeller ever satisfied? No, no. The, in 1 Timothy 6.10, it says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So one thing we know about the love of money, it, it, it steals our faith and it brings many grief. In Matthew 19, the, what was the problem with the rich young man that came to Jesus? He gave up salvation for money, wealth. He was a wealthy man. You know, in the parable of the sowers, what, what was the, the thorns choked away what? It says, but the worries of life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things that come in the world choked the word, making it unfruitful. So as Christians, what we can, what can the love of money do for us? It makes us unfruitful. You know, um, Steve Mitchell would say this, he taught about this a little bit. He would say, you know, I sort of looked at my 401k about two, three times a day. So that's not a, that's not a good thing. You know, you gotta, you gotta pay attention. You know, so, 
So what happens to worldly treasure is it eventually is lost. In Matthew 6, 19 through 21, it says, Do not store up yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up your treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. And when, for where your treasure is, your heart will also. So we need to keep track we need to keep track of what our heart truly desires and we remember that the love of money, not money, the love of money brings grief. Ecclesiastics 5.12 says, The sleep of the labor, laborer is sweet, whether they eat little or much, but as for the rich, the abundance of permits them no sleep. So my dad was a farmer, and he taught me that, you know, a hard day's work was an honest day work. You could be content, you know, and, and knowing that as, as an honest, I did an honor day, day's work, I could sleep well. But the love of money, the more you have, the, the rich just can't sleep because they're just worried about it. You know, I, I remember um, in my early career, I would go to my boss and I said, I really, really want a boat. I want a ski boat. And uh, he said, you know, what, you know what boat means for the acronym of boat? And he goes, bankruptcy on a trailer. <laughs> so I never got one. Ecclesiastics 5, 13 through 17 is, I have seen grievous evil under the sun. Wealth hoarded to the harm of its owners, or wealth lost through the, the misfortunes, so that when I have children, there is nothing left for them to inherit. Everyone comes naked from the mother's womb, and everyone comes so they depart. They take nothing from their toil that they carry, in their hands. This too is a grievous evil. As everyone comes, so will they depart, and what they gain since, since they toil for the wind. All their days they eat in the darkness with great frustration, affliction, and anger. So hoarding and frustration brings you harm and misfortune. So what happens to 70% of the people that win the lottery? They're bankrupt in a year. So I always wondered why all of a sudden now there's all kinds of gambling sites. But every commercial I hear, they give a phone number in case you have a problem with gambling. This, this doesn't make any sense to me. There's shows on TV where hoarders pay people to get rid of their stuff. That just doesn't make sense to me. I even have a friend at church that works for a person that goes into people's houses and helps them get rid of their junk. So in verse 17, not only does it say their wealth means nothing at the end, but it can bring great frustration and it can bring affliction and anger. I have a camper, and when that thing, I get it out in the summer and half of it's broke, that's frustration. So hoarding wealth brings no joy but grief. So in Ecclesiastics 5, 18 through 19, this is what I have observed to be good, that it is appropriate for a person to eat, to drink, and to find satisfaction in their toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life God has given them, for this is their lot. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and to be happy in their toil, this is a gift of God. So 
this is such a contrast to what we were just talking about in, in verse 13 through 17. So those who consider God to be their source of, source of wealth, God allows them to enjoy their labor. You know, this is a gift of God. In Matthew 7, it, it says that, it talks about, Jesus talks about that even someone that is evil they wouldn't, if their son asked for bread, they wouldn't give him a stone. If he asked for a fish, he doesn't give him a snake. So how much more, as children of God, would our Father give us something that is good? You know, we just, we just don't realize how good our God is to us. In Ecclesiastes 25:20, 20, it says, they seldom reflect on their days of their life because God keeps them occupied with gladness in, the, in their heart. So as children of God, we can even have joy even though we're in times of trouble. Um, um, Jeff and I went and visited a, a gentleman that was in hospice uh, last Saturday and he could barely talk or anything, but the only, the only thing he said is he sort of was making, making a joke of what Jeff was saying. I can't remember exactly what, but even in this time of worse trouble, he's, he's, he's joking, even though he can't hardly, you know, have a problem breathing, you know. He was just, he was just happy with the lot that he had because he knew the Lord. So as children of God, God gives us gifts to enjoy. In Ecclesiastes 6, two, uh, 6, 1 and 2, I have seen another evil under the sun, and it weighs heavily on mankind. God gives some people wealth, possession, and honor so that they lack nothing that their heart desires, but does not grant them the ability to enjoy them and strangers enjoy them instead. This is meaningless, a grievous evil. In contrast, the unbeliever has no joy in his wealth. In the parable of the talents, God, uh, the three servants, the one servant that was given one talent, he just buried it. He didn't, he didn't use it. And because he didn't use it, what did God do? He took it from him. He took it from him. So wealth does not bring happiness. In Ecclesiastes 6, 3 through 6, a man may have hundreds of children and live, and live many years, yet no matter how long he lives, he cannot enjoy the, his prosperity and does not receive a proper burial. I say that a stillborn child is better than he. It comes without meaning. It departs in darkness, and in darkness its name is shrouded. Though it is never saw under the sun or knew anything, it has been more rest does that man even if he lives a thousand years twice over but fails to enjoy his prosperity, do not all go to the same place. So Solomon compares the man with great wealth but, to the, but does not use it for God. It's better that he was never what? Born. Born. In Ecclesiastes 6, 7 through 10, everyone toils for their mouth, yet their appetite is never satisfied. What adventure have, have the wise over a fool's? What does the poor gain by knowing how to conduct themselves before others? Better what, what the eye sees than the roving of the appetite. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Whatever exists has already been named and in what humanity it has been known no one can be content with someone who is stronger so toiling without
God never satisfied. There's always, there's always somebody stronger. Um, at least I was as growing up because I got beat up a lot. But, but no matter how great you are, there always seems to be somebody um, that is better than you. But with God, we know, we know our future, and only God knows the future of what is going to happen on this earth. But as Christians, we know that our future is in heaven, and we can be content with that. So this is like one of my favorite verses in Ecclesiastics. It's Ecclesiastics 6.11. There are more words, the less the meaning. And how does that profit anyone? So I, I'm, I'm assuming we all know people that have lots of words but don't say anything. So the words of this world are, are, are meaningless and without profit. But sometimes... I think we just need to, to listen to God. It says in Psalms 46, 10, it says, Be still, and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. So the last verse is Ecclesiastes 6, 12. For, for who knows what good for a person in life during the few meaningless days they pass through like a shadow. Who can tell them what happened under the sun after they are gone? So only God knows what will happen after we're gone. So in conclusion, there are things that can steal our joy and the fruits of our labor. It's not realizing that corruption in the government is just a fact. You know, we can all worry about politics, but it, it doesn't matter. You know, I'm 68, and as long as I paid attention to politics and government, it's been corrupt. It's just a fact. And we shouldn't let that steal the fruit of our labor, our happiness. The love of money can only bring grief. You know, I found out the more the things I have, the more I worry about them. You know, less is, less is usually better. Hoarding wealth brings no joy but grief. You know, um, usually people that hoard, that hoard things, all their attention is just on what they want to hoard, you know, whether it be baseball cards or or I shouldn't say this, I, I love records, so I hoard records. You know, but they can become an obstacle to my, to my joy, you know, or, or your joy, you know. Um, you know, if you have, uh, I, I used to know friends, they have like a cabin up north, they have snowmobiles, they have a camper, you know, they have all these things to take care of, and it gets away in their walk with God. doesn't mean those things are bad, but they can get in the way and, and take away your, your grief, take away your joy. And, and we know that wealth doesn't bring happiness because uh, from what I know about J.D. Rockefeller, that he wasn't a happy man because he always needed that one more dollar. So... But being content with God gives us what we, we realize as children of God. God gives us gifts to enjoy. And I, and I was thinking about it. I was uh, watching the um, India video today. And I was thinking about the, the poorest person in America is probably richer than 90% of the people in India or Haiti. You know, as Americans, we have so much. And we need to realize is, is that's a gift from God. You know, I could have been, you know, I could have been born in Afghanistan. You know, it's, it's a gift of God of what we have here. And I, I think we need to realize that. So um, I can't read the timer, but I, I think I'm early.
So let me pray, and then we can go to our groups. Father, we just thank you for uh, the gift of our, our Lord Jesus Christ in whom, in whom our hope is. And Lord, I, I pray as we go into discussions that your Holy Spirit would, would further teach us. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.